wear this fucking thing because I'm high risk, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, we start with the F word. Okay, good. Uh, I'm actually not speaking about Arabic. I'm speaking about cedars. It, but it is informed by my uh, experience in designing Arabic typefaces. So uh, I quite often uh, get client requests like, ah, could you please do an Arabic sans serif? Which uh, is not the right question to ask in the first place. Arabic companion to a sans serif would be a much better question, but we're getting there. Um, the, the system that I'm going to show you today, this is the type descriptor system, which is in place in I Love Typography, which is currently the thing that takes most of my time. So I divide my time between my foundry, Arabic type, and I Love Typography, which almost 11 months ago launched as a font distributor as well, and recently as an academy also. So um, yeah, we do too many things. <laughs> um, anyways, so as part of launching, um, this will be a little bit of an intro, and then I will start the slides. So as part of launching the new website, we wanted to make it easy for people to discover fonts. And for us to be able to speak about typefaces in a way that is not biased per script or another, something that is inclusive, something that is not centric in one geographic location or another. And uh, what is typical when you go, whether it is in typography books or in font distribution websites, that you have these categories, serif, sans serif, grotesques, humanists, old style, old who, God knows why. But anyways, so there's all these uh, categories that are ref referencing specific times in history, why a certain genre is called grotesque, is because they hated it when it first came out. Uh, it's really difficult to speak with this, but anyways. Okay, so, um, so, so that was, um, that was one of the problems of why those categories we found, like we still have them obviously, but they feel to be missing because it feels like you need to put a typeface in one bucket or another, and typefaces are systems of variety. Like we actually see it in variable fonts today. It doesn't make sense to put them in one bucket and not another because lots of interesting things happen on those boundaries. So there is that. But then the bigger reason why we wanted to find another way to be able to talk about typefaces is because those categories are very Latin centric. So when we talk about serif and sans serif, we, like those categories do not make sense for so many scripts out there. And so we wanted to just start from scratch. So we have the categories, but we have this other thing. I will go very quickly over the slides because you guys are, you will know what they mean. I don't need to explain what contrast means. But anyways, so Cedars Plus is a Cedars, if, uh, is a, Sequence, it's an acronym. Uh, each one stands for something. We're going to go through the letters. Plus is not in this presentation, and then I'll explain why it needs to be there. And then towards the end, I'll explain why it's missing so many things and what the next steps would be. And then hopefully you guys will give me feedback and not throw the chairs at me. So let's see. <laughs> so first is contrast. I, so nice, I don't have to explain contrast to you, but this is a very helpful way to discuss uh, variations in script modulation, uh, sorry, in stroke modulation, that is not referencing one particular style on another. So typically when I get asked for, can you do an Arabic sans serif, it means low contrast Arabic, right? That's typically what they mean, plus a few other things, but this brings with it so many connotations. So being able to describe that what you are interested in is actually specific modulation and contrast settings is quite helpful when we're talking about a script that does not have serifs or a tradition of serifs at all. Uh, and here you can see, and, and I'm showing only the extreme variations. So you will have the really high contrast and the really low contrast or none, and you have the steps in the middle. Another axis would be the energy. So this one, we, I, I, I get the feeling that we don't speak enough about energy uh, it, it, within type design, but, uh, but it's something that is very important when we're trying to understand what's happening within a typeface. So um, we can go from static to very high energy, but it's quite important. So for example, if I'm talking about different styles in Arabic, for example, dynamic calligraphic Arabic versus the neo nasr with a flat bass line, the structure is different, but there's also a different sense of energy because that energy is coming from the speed of the movement and that speed of movement affects the way we react to such a typeface because we read it differently because we remember 
and we are sensitive to, the reason why it has more energy is because it was written faster, and therefore it contains that movement and that energy and everything that implies. And we see that difference clearly when we look at contrasting different typefaces on energy level. Then we have everything which we lumped under details. So uh, some of the details would be the finials. So for example, if you are restrained, or if you are flourished, or you are both. So the finials is really just that terminal of the character. And are you being deliberate and stopping, or are you swinging a little bit when you stop that movement? And you can see here in the slightly different variations within, within this, these two typefaces. Another uh, detail would be the stem. So the stem is basically how the stem is actually finishing, like how it sits on the baseline. Is it sitting at an angle? Is it a flare? Or is it, for example, script specific, which in the case of Latin is a serif. In the case of Thai, it's a loop. In case of Arabic, it could be something else, right? So the way those stems sit on the baseline is one way of how we can describe different typefaces. Then there is the transition. And for this, this is one of my favorites, funny enough, and it's just so basic. If we're looking at, and we have like different examples, of course, in each, and you can see them on the Cedars like, page on ILT, so I don't need to put everything here, but it's quite interesting when we are looking at the transition of arches into verticals. Are they blended? Is it one continuous arch? Or do they stop and intersect at an angle? And this has quite an impact on that feeling of the typeface, because it has a feeling of either a smooth movement or one that is sort of stop and go. So there is that slight stopping every time you have that kind of intersection. And it makes a big difference, particularly when you are doing you know, a companion to a Latin, and you're looking at the typeface, and you're trying to understand what is happening in the Latin so that I can have a similar DNA in the Arabic. This type of intersection is something that we look at. And then we have the fill. Is it a filled solid? Is it in line? Is it texture? It's good to have these descriptors, because when we're looking for typefaces, we need to see like, ways to find the typefaces we're looking for quickly. And it's something that we can easily describe. And then we have the A, the axis. And this is quite easy. I mean, you can see it is vertical, it's at an angle, and in some cases, it's variable. So for example, in typical Nasr, uh, traditional typefaces, it's variable because we don't hold the same the pen at the same angle the whole time. We rotate the nib as we go, and so there is a variable angle, so that we choose variable. And then there's the rhythm, and this is um, again split into different parts. So we have the pattern, and in the pattern there is you know the very tight to the very loose, and I have the feeling that I didn't put enough steps in the middle, but basically we're describing how often, what is the rhythm of those verticals when they're coming down? Whether it is in Latin, in Arabic, or whatever it is, are they sitting very close to one another, or are they very far from one another? And then you have that tempo. And the tempo is basically how, re how regular is it, that beat that you are hearing. If you imagine that every time a vertical stroke comes down, it makes a ping, and these are these sounds, how regular do we hear them, or how irregular? And so that, again, is quite interesting, because, for example, 100 years ago, Latin typefaces had, some of them at least, a more irregular rhythm than what we see today. Like, we have on ILT now 875 typeface families. They've all been described with cedars. Almost all of them are regular. So we don't have enough of the irregular rhythm, even though there is quite an interesting design uh, expression to have when you don't have that regular rhythm happening. So it's quite interesting to see because this helps us find gaps in where there is and is not representation. And then the structure, and even though this is the last one, <laughs> but it's actually the most important, and the structure obviously is the skeletal system. And this was the hardest to actually come up with a system for, a descriptor, because it's, it's not intuitive. The other ones, we feel them and we use those words quite often, but these ones, not so much. So we go through geometric forms, right? Because the shapes we draw in those letter forms typically have some form of geometric definition to them. So we have 
type faces that have a triangular loop, those closed shapes. Nas would be triangular. This particular typeface, also triangular. You can see in the shape of the A. And then with the oval, that is another example. Oval would be a little bit like a frutiger. When you're looking at the O and at the way the top arch sort of falls into, the, so the top tangents are falling into the vertical tangents, they fall very quickly. But then the circular, obviously circular, with the super ellipse, they go out a lot and then they fall. And so that would give you something more like an Helvetica. And then the circular obviously is a more geometric, but that's if you are in the sans serif genre. Obviously, if you are speaking serifs, it would be something else completely. Or if you are speaking other scripts, again, that, that would give you another category as we know it. But the basic definition of that loop would be this. And so these are different uh, visualizations of how we could see them. And then with the construction as well, there is the sort of intent of how we draw. So for example, the formal one is one which is rhythmic and you lift the pen. So there is no continuous movement, but there is a formal definition and intent when you are writing. The cursive would be similar to the formal, but it is attached. So it's, you have that continuous sense of movement between the characters. But then you have the organic, which has more freedom in its formation. So it's not as repetitive and it's not as easy to predict as when you go with, this, with, this, uh, with the uh, cursive. The cursive, for example, if you wrote the first three letters, you can easily predict the angle of the fourth one before you type it, because there is that sense of angle to it that is repeating. But then in the organic, you don't know. You have a rough idea because there is a system happening, but you can't really predict. And so there is more organic movement within that style. And so this is one example of how you see different constructions. So one is deliberate, one, but stop and go. So you lift and then you continue, then you lift and then continue. One is cursive. There is formal intent, but it is continuous. And then the top one, of course, is the organic happy go around type of thing. So this is what I wanted to show you in terms of slides. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the plus sign. Because what we are doing with these descriptors, obviously they're not categories. They're ways to talk about typefaces and to filter through the collections we have. But there is more in type design. For example, in Latin, the A is single story or double story. The G, single or double, but then we can get more inventive. The midpoint of the M, is it floating or is it sitting on the baseline? The leg of the R, is it straight? Is it wavy? Is it convex or is it concave? Or is it curling, right? These are different ways of features that we can find in Latin. For example, in Arabic, we have nas, we have kufi, we have nastalik, and we have with terwis, without terwis, with a horizontal baseline, without a horizontal baseline, cascading, not cascading. There are other things that are specific. In Thai, we have loops, we have without loops, and that's where my knowledge of Thai stops, so I can't speak more. But basically, what we put the plus for is for the script-specific features. So the system as it currently stands and the way it is implemented, that the 875 typefaces are filtered by all of these that I've showed you, plus the plus for Latin. So we have things like the midpoint of the M, the crossbars, if they are high, low, mixed, or what else, the proportion of X height to cap height, the, uh, what else? There's so many, they're, they're on the website anyways, you can see them. But those are for Latin. And so this is where we are at this point in time, and we still miss many more steps. So for example, we need the plus for practically every other script as well. We, I can start with the Arabic, but I don't have the expertise to do anything more than the Arabic. And so the idea is that we would have groups to consult us on what would be the correct and the right descriptors for the scripts that we would like to describe. So this is a collaborative process because we cannot do it on our own. We need the experts. So that is one where we need to grow. But then there is another aspect which is even more problematic. And that is consistency in describing. Because in the first, so we launched two cohorts in ILT. The first cohort, we made the descriptors, we gave them to the foundries and they were supposed to input them. But even when we told them what the descriptors were, they still inputted them wrong. Not all of them, some of them. 
and uh, some of them decided that they don't agree with our description, so they put their own. So you have a problem of consistency. For the second cohort, we didn't give them that option. We deactivated it, and I put them myself. And, and so this is, this is where the whole system would fail if it becomes open to interpretation. Because a system that does not have objective interpretation to it, or at least, if not objective, at least a unified acceptance of what a descriptor means, will not work. So for example, uh, on a competitor website, which is very big, you are allowed to put your own tags and to describe your typefaces as you like them. And you will have typefaces that are script typefaces that have been described as geometric sans serifs. Some people tried that with our site as well. And so if we are to leave this type descriptor system to be something that the foundry applies or the designer applies, we will have a lot of creativity in how these descriptors are applied, which means the filter system will become crap, just like the crap we see on my phones. So, which is not what we want. <laughs> yeah, I'm very unapologetic, sorry. So anyways, so, so this, is, this is where the system is problematic because currently, only me and Kaya, only two people are able to describe typefaces based on cedars. So if I take the mask off and I get COVID, there's very few people who can actually use the system. But luckily, we live in a time of automation and machine learning. And the answer, at least what I think would be correct, would be when we get to a milestone where enough typefaces have been described by hand by human people and discussed and agreed, then we can get the machines to understand that system and to do it automatically. And that by then you teach the machine and then the machine will be, uh, how do you say, consistent in its application. So yeah, so that's sort of where the system is. Uh, for us at the moment, it's a filtering system of how we use to describe world scripts. We don't use the word non-Latin, except when we need to talk about something that is non-Latin. We just talk about world scripts in general. And um, yeah, so it's a filtering mechanism. There is, however, or there have been uh, suggestions that perhaps this is something that could sit in the font, that we could read it, that this could be a possible alternative to panos, which again has been applied inconsistently and is useless by now. So I think when we want to talk about how do we categorize typefaces, I would say we should not categorize typefaces. We can use the categories that we know as is because they are mental shortcuts, but we need to understand that they will only get us so far and at some point they will fail because there are not enough buckets in the world to describe all the typefaces that have been designed so far. So, so there is that, but then there is also the, the system in itself, the variability of that system, and then there is also the application and interpretation of that system. So, if we can together as a group come up with a consistent logical way of describing typefaces based on the nature of the stroke and that movement, and then get the machines to learn it, and then get it in a way that is accessible and open to everyone, then that system can help people in whatever way they want to apply it. We use it as a filter, but there are other ways, or oh, we're not gonna tell you what they are, but we have plans for it. But anyways, so that's what I wanted to say. And please, ah, wait, wait, one more thing. Did I say that the, the serif is in the plus section? It's a script specific thing. That's what I expected people to throw the chairs at me at because <laughs> it's not in cedars, it's in the plus because not all scripts have serifs. But anyways, that's it. Uh, thank you, and please, any questions? Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>